following lecture was produced by Glorian Publishing, a nonprofit organization, and is one of hundreds of lectures freely available via download, podcasts, streaming radio, and transcription. These lectures range in topic and complexity in order to address the many needs of humanity. We invite you to browse our library of lectures, books, courses, and articles to find teachings that suit you. Through the support of donations, Glorian Publishing has published 40 books, hosts international retreats several times a year, offers free online courses, and many other valuable resources, available to anyone worldwide. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Your donations make it possible for this free public service to reach thousands of people every day. To make a tax-deductible donation in any amount, even anonymously, visit GnosticTeachings.org. Now, with heartfelt wishes for the end of suffering for all creatures, we begin the lecture. May all beings be happy. Hello, everyone. Our lecture today will be on the chakras, which is a topic that is very popular. It's a, a theme that we find in many different um, spiritual schools and traditions. It does have a lineage into antiquity, particularly in the East. Unfortunately, um, there is so much to say about the chakras today in this world that um, many people just repeat a lot of different theories or they have kind of a, a misconception of what the chakras are. So I want to talk today and kind of give a basis of how these chakras fit into the big picture, so to say. Many people are interested in these different magnetic centers or centers of energy in the body, but there's something missing with you know, how it relates to awakening and self-realization. If we were to talk about energy in relationship to the chakras, we need to begin with talking about the source of that energy, which is the absolute. Because these chakras, whether they are related to our physical body or vital body, our body of energy, or related to our astral body, or any of the inner subtle bodies, really the source of this is the absolute, because from that everything emerges. So we should think about how does this energy manifest in the, again, in Sanskrit, in the Eastern uh, nomenclature, there's a word called Mula Prakriti. And the Mula Prakriti represents an unmanifested, um, uncreated, abstract energy, abstract force. And in the Kabbalah, we, this is related to the Ein Sof. And from there we say that is the unmanifested cosmic mother. But from there, the manifest, uh, manifestation emerges through a process. And part of this process is the Christ, or the Logos, fecundating the word into the matter. Uh, gestating that vibration so it becomes a substance in this existence. And we talk about, in the past, three law, uh, two, two, two different laws, the law of three and the law of seven. And we say that the law of three is the basis of creation. Everything that is created, whether it's the universe, or whether it's an idea in our head, or whether it's a relationship between two people, can be found had to have its basis in the law of three. And that is the basic um, positive, negative, and neutral. Thesis, antithesis, and synthesis. 
But that law of three and its creative properties manifests and organizes in the law of seven. So we can see that law of seven in the seven chakras that we talk about. But when we are relating this to the creation of the universe, creation of existence, we would talk about the seven laya centers. So these seven laya centers are an organization at that high level of the cosmic creator level, the cosmic Christ. But they are organizing this, this energy to create in different levels. So every level of creation has these seven laya centers, whether it's our physical body, a planet or a star, a solar system or a galaxy. Always is going to be organized in the, by the number seven. So this is, this is one of the reasons why you find the number seven so prevalent in different esoteric books and different religions. You have the seven uh, seals in the book of Revelation. You have the seven churches also. The number seven is very prevalent in the, whole, the entire book of Revelation. <clears throat> so we can talk about this primordial substance in different ways. And... You know, starting at the Mula Prakriti and then, and then going into manifestation, there's different ways to look at the, the condensation or the crystallization of that, of that energy into more and more dense levels. So, so in Kundalini Yoga, Samuel and Vior writes about the Kundalini, O Devi Kundalini, you are the fire of the seven Laya centers of the universe. The seven Laya centers of the universe are the seven degrees of power of the fire. Seven churches exist in the chaos where the seven planetary logoi officiate. These seven churches also exist within the spinal medulla of the human being. So suddenly these seven magnetic centers, we talk about the chakras, aren't just something that is manifesting uh, in us as a human being, but is really a reflection of creation itself. And at that level, the logo I are organizing the whole universe in different um, cosmic chakras or laya centers. Now, Talking about this universal fire, or sometimes we call it, call, call it that Devi Kundalini in a cosmic sense. From there, you have different ways of this energy descending. And sometimes we talk about the energy descending in relationship to the tree of life. But here we're talking about different manifestations of energy as it, as it crystallizes. Um, first, we can talk about the prana. And from prana, we can talk about the akash. And from the akash, we can talk about the ether. And from the ether, we can talk about the tattvas. And from the tattvas, we can then talk about the chakras. Because if you start with the chakras, you're kind of starting at the end point. Because the chakras are all related with these other levels of energy. So prana is everywhere. Prana is the great breath. Prana, it is the cosmic Christ. Prana is the life that palpitates in every atom as it as it palpitates in every sun. Fire burns because of prana. Water flows because of prana. Wind blows because of prana. The sun exists because of prana. The life we have is prana. Nothing can exist in the universe without prana. So this is this universal life force. It's, a, it's the substrate of everything. We see this word in the practice of pranayama, which is the yoking or harnessing of the prana. So even though we're talking about prana as this first type of manifestation from the absolute, it's still here right now. It's still a substance that we work with. But the prana also has a relationship, we can say, uh, with different modifications as it comes down into the akash or akasha. And the akasha is modified into the ether. And the ether is transformed into the tattvas. And the tattvas are the basis for the four elements. But it all becomes synthesized, even within any, within any tattva, is, is the prana.
And on this slide, I just have a, a visual of how this energy is, is descending down or crystallizing into, into more you know, dense forms, so to speak. Because I guess below the tattvas, you could put the physical elements as well. So, you know, starting at the Mula Prakriti, which is that unmanifested chaos or root nature. That's what Mula means, root. Prakriti is nature. Prana is the life force or the cosmic Christ, that great breath. And Akasha. Sometimes Akasha and, pr and Prana are very similar. Sometimes they're almost used in an in interchangeable sense. Um, but Akasha is a primordial substance is the root tattva. So sometimes Akasha is related to the that fifth element or the quintessence of uh, alchemy. And from the Akasha, we can, s we can divide that into the four ethers. <coughs> or in this sense, the four tattvas. And those four tattvas are Tehas, which is the fire, Vayu, which is air, Apas, water, and Prithvi, which is earth. So you have those four tattvas entering into the seven chakras. And before we speak about different spiritual powers or capacities, which is usually the first place that someone wants to go to when they're talking about the chakras, I think it's important to understand how this relates with how our physical body and how our vital body and how our inner bodies whether they're solar or lunar, are operating right now in relationship to these chakras. So the question becomes, us as a, as a living organism, we have our blood cells, we have different chemicals in our body. And where are they coming from? How does this relate? Because with those different chakras, you have different chakras related to different organs, and you have chakras related to glands of secretion, endocrine gl glands. And if I could skip a few. The, one of the major chakra, uh, one of the major functions of the chakras is to condense that energy into our physical body. And how is that happening? That's happening many times through the glands of secretion. So those tattvas are going through the chakra and being transformed or being put into that molecular structure we call hormones. So again, let's read in the fundamental notions of endocrinology and criminology. Our ethereal body is formed by the tattvas. The tattvas and the chakras are intimately related. The tattvas enter the chakras and then pass into the interior of the glands of internal secretion. When the tattvas are inside of these minute endocrine laboratories, the glands, they intensify the glands' work by transforming themselves into hormones. Thus, the tattvas enter the organism, but do not leave it. The tattvas also transform themselves into genes and chromosomes that later on transform themselves into spermatozoids. Everything comes from the ether. Everything returns to the ether. So here, physically, we need to kind of recognize that, that there is a relationship with how our organs are functioning. And here we are talking about you know, hormones in the glands of secretion. But another word is neurotransmitter or chemical messenger. Because there's two types of chemical messengers. One is called a hormone, which is a chemical messenger that's released into the bloodstream and reaches its target seconds or minutes later. So a, a hormone can be released in the pituitary gland or something like that. And there's going to be a relationship between the glands in your brain and your sexual glands. And one could be mes make, uh, giving a message to the other. Where a neurotransmitter is, is a chemical release between two neurons in a very tiny gap called the neurosynap neurosynaptic cleft. So that's, that's the chemicals they talk about in the brain, those neurotransmitters. And what's the difference? The difference isn't that there's a different molecular structure to them, it's just how they're used. So dopamine and adrenaline are both a hormone and a neurotransmitter. So when the master's talking about hormones, he's also talking about those neurotransmitters as well, because they're the same, it's the same chemical, it's just used in a different way. So dopamine, for example, we think of as a chemical in the brain, 
Um, most people have an idea that there's this chemical called dopamine, and it has to do with reward circuitry in the brain, but it also has a tremendous function throughout all, your, all of your organs in the solar plexus as well. There's a lot of uh, dopamine in your gut, for example, but it's not used as a neurotransmitter, it's used as a hormone. So these chakras, how they're operating, are going to influence your chemical activity in your body, right? We talk about different ethers in the vital body, there's the, the chemical ether. So that is a, that relationship. From here, you know, we, we, we talk about having someone having like a, a chemical imbalance, whether that's something to do with a mental disorder or some types of, of imbalance related to our functioning. Uh, someone has a, a hyper or hypothyroid or different types of activities with these glands, they're managing the way our physical body is operating. So if our chakras are, if we're making use of, you know, how we could best influence the, our chakras, we're going to better influence our glands of secretion. And again, we have different esoteric practices, such as the exercises for rejuvenation, and uh, the runic practices, which are trying to place the physical body in certain locations, certain um, configurations, certain postures, and combined with prayer and mantras, you can influence those chakras to influence your glands, to influence your cells and your whole body to regenerate itself. And that's why, you know, the exercises of rejuvenation are working, is because you are placing your body in, in, a, in a configuration that's going to be most helpful for that chakra or for that plexus to receive that energy. And plus you combine that with a mantra and you combine that with prayer. You are setting yourself up to receive that energy in the most beneficial fashion. Now the other half of it, of course, is that we all have karma and there may or may not be the ability to completely over, um, overrule that karma. It may be a type of karma that can't really be forgiven or maybe a karma that's going to take a lot of comprehension to uh, be removed. So I think it's very important to understand that these chakras aren't just simply things that awaken and give us spiritual powers. They are our senses and our organs of our soul. Uh, in the normal individual, the seven chakras are just the senses of the animal soul. So another thing we have to understand is the difference between the chakras, and sometimes we'll talk about the seven churches. Normally, those seven chakras that we have are, are just that. They are our senses and our organs almost of our animal soul. So we are, th those are just properties of any creation. But if the chakras are a, a function of the animal soul, then how does it relate with our spirit? And that's how, that's when we start talking about the seven churches. Because when, when you, when you realize the divine fire, which we call kundalini, which that divine fire is a modification of the prana. The kundalini is a fundamentally, uh, a substance of the akash, the akashic kundalini, you could say. That's giving you that connection to your spirit. And that's providing that connection to that, that chakra. So that chakra becomes connected to the church. So the seven churches exist in, this, in the world of the spirit. In um, Geberah, the spiritual soul. Those, that's the fundamental basis of the seven churches. But when you raise the kundalini, you are transforming that chakra in you are, I should say, connecting that chakra to the church so that energy is becoming activated in you. Obviously, there's already that connection there. There's some level of connection there. But through the work of transmutation, the work of awakening, you are providing that conscious connection. You are becoming awake to that intelligence of that connection. So sometimes when we speak uh, a little more generally, we might interchange the word chakra or church. But really the fundamental, you know, to get more specific about it, is that the church is related to the spirit. 
And when we activate those uh, chakras in a spiritual sense, we are, as the book of Revelation says, sending the word to those seven churches. So what is a church, right? A church is a place of congregation where the disciples congregate. So you could think of those seven churches as your spiritual seven lias centers where the archetypes of the Lord congregate. That's why they're called the church. And we develop our archetypes and, we, and they become awake and they are in those seven churches. So you may have an experience in the inner worlds and if you're asked to go to a church depending on your experience you may find yourself in a church but it's, it's related to your own church or to the church of your spirit it's different ways to symbolize right, so we talked about the prana we talked about how the prana manifests itself into the tattvas and the tattvas are related to the chakras, and the chakras put that tattvic energy into the molecular structure, which influence our whole body. <clears throat> so now that we've, we've kind of talked about all the, this organization, let's actually mention the chakras themselves. There's a lot of different ways to symbolize the chakras, a lot of different um, graphics. A lot of different ways that they're described, and they're described a little bit differently in, um, you know, Tibetan literature versus the Indian literature. So I'm not going to focus, you know, on the very kind of specific symbols in the chakras, and there's different words and mantras related to each one. You definitely can get benefit from that, but it's not where I'm going to focus this lecture. The seven fundamental chakras are listed here on this slide. The base chakra is the muladhara chakra then you have the chakra related to the prostate or uterus which is the svadhisthana chakra then you have the chakra related to the solar plexus which is the manipura chakra then you have the chakra related to the heart which is the anahata chakra then you have the chakra related to the larynx at the throat which is the vishuddha chakra then you have the chakra at the uh, level of the brow between the eyes the root of the nose is the anya chakra and then you have the chakra of the crown, which is the Sahasrara chakra. Now, if we were to go into a lot of detail, there's some books that you could read. I don't know if it's necessarily tremendously important, but you could read all about all these different nadis. We talk about three fundamental nadis, which are energy channels. They're not physical energy channels. These are channels related to the vital body, and the other inner bodies. We talk about the three main nadis, are Ida, Pingala, and Shushumna. And again, this is related to the law of three. In this sense, Ida is the lunar current, and Ida and Pingala are connected from, some people would say just the base of the spine, but really they're connected to the gonads. So in men, that's the testicles, and woman, that would be the ovaries. So an ida in the masculine body is related to the right gonad and connects to the left nostril. And women, that is switched, to the left gonad to the right nostril. While pingala, the solar nadi, in man, that is the opposite. It's the left gonad to the right nostril, and in woman, it is the right gonad to the left nostril. And then the middle column is the Shushumna. Now again, there's a lot of texts that talk about all these more particular uh, details. Because inside the Shushumna are, are other finer nadis. We can call, uh, you know, in, the, in, in the Shushumna is the Vajrini, and in the Vajrini is the Sitrini, or Setrini. And you can see some pictures here that are kind of outlining some of that. And the one on the bottom right, relates to the, the number of nadis given in the body is the 72,000 different nadis. So we don't need to study the 72,000 nadis <laughs> in detail because in synthesis, they're, they're going to be synthesized by the seven chakras, obviously. 
But what's important to re recognize is that there's chakras everywhere. We talk about the seven fundamental chakras, but there's more than seven chakras. This chakra is just a place where that energy collects and is transformed in some certain way, denser. But there's chakras everywhere, right? We have the seven fundamental chakras, um, but we have a chakra of the lungs. We have chakras at the bottom of our feet and our hands. We ha you know, there's going to be chakras essentially with every, almost every joint and almost every organ. So there are just different ways that energy is um, flowing throughout our body. One thing to note is that, again, the chakras aren't necessarily something spiritual. Because the chakras are just a place where energy is congregating. Now, if it's spiritual energy, that could be transformed into the church. But that energy can flow in a negative way as well. Because these chakras are just the senses of our soul. So we have to emphasize that one way is for the chakra to spin in a positive direction. Another is for the chakra to spin in a negative uh, direction. We want the chakras to spin from left to right. I have a friend who uh, would imagine, you know, if you were turning your steering wheel from left to right, and if you're driving a car and turning a steering wheel from left to right, that would be the direction of, of the positive flow. So then, what, is, what does it mean to have the chakras flowing in the opposite direction? What, what does that mean? That would mean that we are acting in a way that's egotistical. So... If we know that there might be a chakra related to clairvoyance, then if that chakra were to be rotating negatively, what would that look like? If we were putting our ego into our ability to imagine something, then that chakra might be rotating in the opposite direction. If you see an impression in the world and you immediately start to think egotistical things and start to envision anxiety and how something could, could uh, become a catastrophe. You start Im imagining all these very kind of subconscious and maybe egotistical events based on a certain impression that's in front of you, a certain event. Well, that's going to be your chakra rotating in a, in, a, in a materialistic way, in a negative way. You're seeing images. You might not be seeing this profound clairvoyant vision, but what we talk about is that clairvoyance is just imagination. So if you're imagining something in that negative sense, then their chakra is going to, be, going to be rotating in that way. That's your chakra rotating in that way. If you have an event, if, if, if you see someone um, driving a very nice car, and you, and you, you're, and you like cars a lot, and, you've really, and you have like a, a junker, and you're envious of this other person who has, you know, their heated leather seats, and you're sitting there cold, and your heat doesn't work, and you're envious... That's, that's your chakras. You're, you're, you're putting energy into your chakras. It might be related to your inner senses. Your animal soul, you're sensing that, and you're using it to, to work your pride through, or work your, I shouldn't say pride, jealousy in this sense, or envy. Right? So you're, you're moving energy. You're in that energy, but you're moving it in a negative way. Whereas if you are moving the energy in a positive way, you are really happy for other people. You're not jealous. You have that happiness. Because if you're connected to your innermost, that's, that's your ultimate wealth. So if you see, whatever you see outside of yourself is not really concerning you anyway. You have your wealth, which is your inheritance from the Lord. If you're connected with that, if you're conscious of that, you're, you have happiness for other people. Even if you're suffering. So we have to differentiate the activation of the chakras between whether we're kind of working them in a positive way or a negative way. Because some people work with the chakras and they, they may even feel very like intense energy in different chakras, but they're doing it in a completely egotistical fashion. So on this slide, in the seven words, uh, the Master Samuel and Veor writes, the chakras in the common and ordinary people are only the senses of the animal soul. Their chakras are intimately related with the psychic, biological functions of the human organism. The tattvas enter through the chakras and then into our endocrine glands. The endocrine glands then transform the tattvas into hormones. So the astral chakras are the gates of entry for the tattvas. <clears throat> So 
So now let's actually talk about some of these chakras. We'll talk about the seven chakras a little bit in detail. And we'll start with the bottom, which is Muladhara. Again, so the Muladhara is that fundamental base chakra. And I think this is a chakra related, obviously, with our you know, the base of the spine and our sexual glands. In here, in a common ordinary person, the, what we call the Kundalini is coiled three and a half times and is sleeping. So today we have a lot of um, different practices outside of this tradition that are called Kundalini Yoga. Uh, Shivananda wrote a book on Kundalini Yoga. That's a, that's a good book. There's many other, other types of practices. There's kund people practicing Kundalini Yoga. Uh, I don't know in particularly what might be good or not about anything, but in order to awaken the kundalini, you have to be working with your sexual energy. In order to be doing anything with the kundalini, you have to be transmuting sexual energy. Now, there's two, two things to differentiate. One is to create some sparks of fire related to the kundalini, which can give experiences, awakenings, epiphanies, which can advance, our, advance ourselves spiritually. And another thing is to actually awaken the kundalini. The only way to actually awaken that kundalini is to transmute with a partner, with a spouse, through uh, mahituna or sexual magic. This is the sexual union of two people who love them, who are in a loving relationship, who are working uh, in, ch in chastity. So, why is this the case? Because there are some who have, who say, they might even be working in chastity, but they believe that they can awaken the kundalini as a single person. The reason why this isn't possible is because there's not enough energy there. There needs to be more energy. The, the awakening occurs, again, through the law of three, the positive, negative, and their interaction, which creates that third force. So you can think of the magnetic induction, the, elec the electromagnetism. When you are performing pranayama, again, the word prana is that life force, Normally, you're, you're breathing through the nose in some sense, combining with a mantra. There's different types of pranayama. You're breathing through, and you're creating a type of current that activates your sexual organs, those gonads, in order to transmute some of that energy and to create an interaction between those solar and lunar atoms. When you are doing pranayama, you're breathing in heavily. And there may be prana in the outside world there, but the, the, the function of pranayama is not to suck in prana. Because the prana is already deposited in your sexual organs. The prana that you're working with is related to that prana that's been deposited there by the chakras into your sexual organs. You're breathing heavily in order to in, in create a movement of energy, but it you know, you're breathing in prana that might go into your lungs and that might go into your bloodstream, but the prana that you're transmuting in that moment isn't the, isn't the air you're breathing in. It's energy that's already in your body. It's already been put there by your Divine Mother through this process of the chakras. So I think that's something important. So it's not so much about how much air you breathe, but how well you can transmute that prana. And that's a a practice that you get more skilled at and seeing how to inhale that, that air through your nose. And sometimes there's a way of restricting your breath through that nose and visualizing that, that it helps transmute that energy through the, out of the uh, gonads. So that is what creates that activity, that transmutation. And, in, and that puts into activity some energy throughout all those nadis. And that's why it's very helpful to transmute somewhat before, you know, through, through pranayama, before meditating. The meditation, you're working with all these chakras as well. 
But that, that type of magnetic induction that you're performing through pranayama, it's enough to, to, to get some energy flowing, but it's not enough to actually awaken the serpent. A kundalini is often symbolized as a serpent. Sometimes it's symbolized just as fire. So this fire, this prana, this akash, which is in the muladhara, needs that activity of sexual, co sexual cooperation. So when a man and a woman sexually unite, obviously a lot of activity is going on. A lot of energy is flowing. And we've talked a lot about this before. There's going to be a lot of temptation. That energy is, in a certain way, blind. It's a creative energy that just want, that if you, let, if you don't control it, will just want to go to whatever is the path of least resistance. If you know anything about electricity, you know that, if, that electricity just always wants to flow in all directions, but it will always pick the way that it can get that it can move with the least resistance. So if you have um, a bunch of wires connected together, if all those wires are identical, it'll just flow through it all. But if you have one piece that's a little bit not as good of a conductor, electricity won't really flow through it because it just it doesn't want to go there. It can go somewhere else easier. You think of water. When water flows down a mountain, it just, it's just always going to pick the way that's easiest for it to go next. It's not going to go up a hill and back down. It's just going to keep going down that hill, right? So it's just this kind of our sexual energy it has all the possibilities in there to be, you know, to create a whole universe. But it's blind. It, it's, it's sleeping. Even though it's, in a certain sense, that cosmic Christ, that divine mother there, but it's sleeping at the same time. So in a normal, uh, the normal, quote-unquote, normal sexual act, related to the animal soul, is just to express that mechanically, and of course, that energy just wants to blindly express itself in whatever the path of least resistance is. And in this sense, because we as, as a soul are so um, trapped in karma and in ego, the normal sexual act is to conclude it with orgasm, to just expel that energy. So obviously, when we talk about sexual magic, we are looking to divert or revert that energy flow and that's a that is done through willpower and it's it's done through a process of learning how to do that but we when we practice that we through restraining that animal sexual impulse we are diverting that energy to be transmuted into something finer so this is why Samuel and Voyol writes that the root of good and evil is found in the church of Euphysis, which is the Muladhara Chakra. Well, good and evil is found in the sexual organs because that is where we fundamentally regenerate or degenerate ourselves. We either go down or up based on our activity there. And again, most people want to talk about the chakras and just the very, everything's very spiritual about it, but Really, there are many people working with some type of sexual yoga. They're, they're, they think they're working with some kind of spiritual practice, but they are combining a sexual activity with desire, with spiritual longing, and maybe even a longing to acquire powers. And they may find a way to activate their chakras, but not through chastity. And there's many, many, many different variations of this. Some of them are including spilling the energy. Some of them are not, but it's still engaging in lust. There's many different ways like uh, to avoid uh, you know, ejaculation versus orgasm, all these different things that I will not get into, into any details about. I just want to be clear that what we're talking about here is restraining and using all of the energy because the energy that's, that, that we're working with in Muladhara Chakra and all the chakras is not just a physical energy. It's not just related to the physical matter of this body. It's related to our vital body. It's related to our astral body. It's related to all those different bodies, all the different energetic uh, components. So, 
a lot of different, there are some different practices that uh, the master alludes to in general terms of how to um, charge, the ener charge the sexual energy in a certain way, but it's through desire. It's not through sacrificing your desire. And that will turn the chakra in a negative sense. The chakra will go in a negative way. And it might even awaken, so to, so to say, but it will awaken that energy to go down. So the energy might try to go up, but the way the master writes is that he says that the three breaths of pure akash, which would be related to your brain, related to the, the pineal gland and the Sahasrara chakra, reject that energy. They reject it, so it goes down. And that is how, we, that is how um, the negative development of the chakras can happen. And this is what is called the tail of Satan, or the kunda buffer. So the kundalini is obviously the opposite of the kunda buffer. And there are negative ma mag mag malignant um, chakras related to the abdomen, which can be developed and in the internal planes is seen as the tail of Satan. So this is where, that's where that symbolism comes from. Is that, that is the descending serpent. That is the serpent that in the tree descended down and, and um, tempted Eve. And we can go into a lot of symbolism about the serpent because there's all, all, um, a lot of positive and healing qualities that are found in uh, different religions related to the serpent. So the serpent is, is, is dual. And that is why the root of good and evil is found in this chakra. And it's related to um, the earth element, Prithvi. It has a, a vowel, which is S or S. And if we were to, we can work with this chakra by, by pronouncing the letter S. So I talked about transmutation. So this is a, a, a quick um, description of when you are transmuting correctly, those three breaths of pure akasha descend through the Brahmanic cord in order to be co combined with the seminal atoms that ascend when the sexual impulse is refrained. So. By putting that sexual activity, by putting that sexual energy into activity, it's looking to just express itself, almost just mechanically. But by refraining that, you're directing it to go up. And bringing with that is the awakening of the chakras. And that's how, through the movement of that energy, all of the, you can say, all the archetypes that, are, that need to develop in your being are related or connected to your sexual energy. So you are giving activity to that. You are growing, or you're fertilizing those archetypes. And I've said before already that the kundalini is something akashic. So the second chakra is svadhisthana which is related to the prostate or uterus. It's related to the water element. And its vowel is M or M. Mm. The yogi or yogini who meditates on this chakra never fears water. He learns to command the elemental creatures of the waters and he conquers occult powers. So we need to understand this, this phrase, which again is in Kundalini Yoga by Samael Unveor. We have to understand that in different levels, and diff we have to meditate on what that means. Because the waters is a symbol, again, the sexual waters, and the being able to be more fluid in your life, to be able to change with circumstances, is related to that. Now, obviously, the full development of that chakra, you would be fully under control of the uh, apas, tattva, in yourself which would allow you to be connected or have influence of that, that tattva outside of yourself. So the true magician or <coughs> magi is someone who has all these chakras developed into the seven churches. And the reason they're able to influence the elements outside of themselves is because they have perfect equilibrium and command of those elements within themselves. 
So just because we say the element of water, it doesn't mean we're talking about just the H2O water in our physical body. We're talking about the tattva, the energetic water element, quote unquote. It's that, that water is a symbol, a type of way that energy flows. It's not just saying just water. Water represents that. So in this three-dimensional world, we see water as something that flows. And it's obviously related to apas. But in the internal worlds, something may be represented by water that's pointing towards what's, that, what's the symbolic content of water? What's that inner content of water? It's something that has the power to move, to, to create a change, to create birth, and to, to flow, to have different shapes depending on its surroundings. The third chakra is the chakra of the solar plexus which is the church of Pergamos. And this is the Tatva Tejas, fire. Its vowel is U, or U. And it's related with uh, telepathy. So this chakra collects the solar forces and nourishes all the other plexuses with them. <coughs> so... It's very interesting because there's a lot of scientific studies about sleep and why we need to sleep. And they obviously we sleep because we get tired and we sleep to refresh ourselves. But at the very like low level of scientists are trying to figure out why this is happening. Like why do we get sleepy? Like what's the fundamental basis for us getting sleepy? And it's really, it sounds almost silly, but it's really elusive as to why the body gets sleepy when it does. It's because it's related to the, to the vital body. It's related to these tatvas and this, this level of energy. Because when you fall asleep, it's this chakra of the solar plexus that is collecting the energy to, to, to re-nourish your body. It's collecting the, that type of fire. Now, I wanted to talk about that fire element because it's such a, a profound symbolism of Of Prometheus. We've talked about Prometheus in many different lectures, but it's such, it, like I said, it's, it's such a moving symbolism to me at least. Because Prometheus is that Titan, an immortal, that delivered fire to man. So we're talking about the, the solar plexus here. So Prometheus is related to that, that, that solar energy that you're receiving as well. But Prometheus, uh, he needed to give a gift or to provide man with something. His brother, Epithes Epithesius, um, who is the after afterthought, he, he he delivered all of the um, all of his um, gifts and powers to all the animals, and then when he got to man, there was nothing left. So Prometheus decided to steal fire from the gods and give it to man. Now, for this act, he was chained to a rock by Zeus, and he was doomed to uh, have his liver eaten every day by a bird. Sometimes it's uh, a hawk, or sometimes it's uh, a buzzard or something, but it, it's, it's a bird of the air. And because he's immortal, every day that would regenerate. So, <clears throat> different ways that we can understand that symbolism. In a certain sense, when we go to sleep, every day we're regenerating ourselves. We're regenerating the sol that solar plexus. But every day we exhaust ourselves uh, because we are so identified with everything. So we're using that energy in a very negative way. Now, the liver is related to your base desires, very egotistical, impure elements. So the liver is something that works with impurities. It purifies them, but it works with a lot of really heavy elements. It helps with digestion. So eating of the liver is related to that pain of our liver, the pain of all these impure elements of wasting the fire. We waste the fire in a lot of different ways. Anytime we're identified with something, anytime we, f we fall into fascination and we cause problems for ourselves, we are using that solar fire in a negative way. We're making those chakras turn in the 
negative or inferior way. And then each night we may regenerate ourselves some bit and then we return to the rat race the next day, so to speak. Now, that fire is also related, of course, with sex. The, f the fundamental way to waste that fire is through sex, through sexual indulgence. The bird, which comes down and eats the liver, we can understand this if we, if we understand the symbolism of the air. So the air represents the mind. And the birds that fly in the air are the elements that are flying in the mind. So the bird that's flying in the air is coming down to eat the liver. So it's through our mind that we are wasting our energy. <clears throat> so he's chained to that rock, and every day he's going through this. We can see how we're, we are causing Prometheus to suffer. Prometheus is the one that gave us that fire, but we are wasting it. Now, in relationship to Prometheus, Zeus creates Pandora, which in the story is the first woman. And, the wo and of course, Pandora has a, has a box. And inside that box is all of the evils of the world. But she's, and she's told not to open it. But of course, the story goes that she opens that box and everything escapes and it's impossible to put it back in the box. And that story, you know, there's a direct analogy there with the story of Eve, who's told not to eat of that fruit of the tree of good and evil. But she does so, and that's when, you know, everything happens. It's negative, all the getting, you know, kicked out of Eden and losing immortality. So, of course, this is not to say that somehow uh, women are evil. It's not the point here. It's not what, but unfortunately, of course, that's that's often been, that's often been the the truth, right? I'm, not, I'm, I'm I said it kind of jokingly, but in reality, this is the type of you know um, superficial symbolism that people have looked have used to justify a lot of um, terrible behaviors. In reality, what's being pointed towards here is that. The feminine aspect of the fire is always the type of the fire that creates. It's always the feminine aspect of that fire, that, that lunar serpent. That is the serpent of creation. That is the serpent that has the capacity to go up or down. So that is the, that is the side of the fire which is being represented by Pandora. And the orgasm is represented to opening that box and all of those evils being let out into the world. Of course, the, the epic story is that in order for Prometheus to be unchained, to, have, to be released from that rock, that, that hard rock of suffering, which is a type of sexual suffering, uh, Hercules has to do it, which is the Superman, which is that person doing those 12 labors and self-realizing himself and incarnating Christ. And Hercules does it, but he does it by, um, as Zeus says, you have to kill someone immortal to take, to take Prometheus's place. So Hercules um, makes an agreement with um, Chiron, who is um, the half man, half horse. I can't remember the word. Centaur, yeah, centaur, yeah. So Chiron, centaur. So Chiron is this uh, character that has a lot of good qualities. He's a teacher. He teaches a lot of, of different um, heroes, but he has this animal aspect as well. So this mixture of the animal and the man needs to die in order for Hercules to unchain Prometheus. And, one, and then Prometheus is unchanged, unchained and, of course, is able then to ascend back into his other half, which is Christ. Because Prometheus is also another symbol for Lucifer. So you can see how um, we have this fire. We misuse the fire. That archetype of, of God, that immortal quality, is suffering because of our mind, because of our passions related to our liver. In order for uh, him to be freed, 
the, the egotistical animal sense of ourselves has to die, and you know, Hercules is the one who does it. So that's all related to Manipura, the solar chakra. Uh, the, the solar chakra is also related to uh, telepathy. And some people are a little surprised by that because they think telepathy is, has something to do with the, the mind or the brain. But really, it's the solar chakra that's your antenna. And this is where we get the gut feelings from sometimes, instinctual type of gut feelings. And, you know, sometimes it's, that's the right thing to listen to sometimes. You do have to listen to your gut sometimes. But your gut might also be telling you to do something animalistic or egotistical as well. But when all of the... You see animals. Animals are always working with their telepathy, with, with, the, with that chakra. They just have their gut instinct and they go and do something. You know, that's why they, they're never getting caught uh, in a... Uh, like a typhoon or, or a, a tidal wave or something. They're, they're, they're the ones running away first or because they know that's coming. They're receiving that energy. So sometimes we have to listen to that. You know, uh, if, if you've ever... Well, for example, I had a, I had a, a particular time I was, I was going to some event, and I was driving there, and it wasn't even a reason to be nervous, but I just felt myself very agitated. I was, like, almost shaking. And I couldn't understand what, what was going on there. Um, but when I got to the place, everybody there wanted to talk to me. There's some, something... There's nothing bad either, but everybody was focusing their energy on me, and I was receiving that. I, th I figured that out later, but so when I was there, I just was, when I was driving there, I just was feeling very, like, shaky, and being kind of somewhat self-aware, I noticed that, so I was very confused until I got there, and I noticed everybody had some, there, there, were, there was some reason why they, I needed to, to be there and handle some problem. So that was that kind of instinctual gut feeling. But if you awaken this chakra positively, this is the chakra that's uh, going to give you the telepathic type of quality. It needs to be combined with other chakras as well, because again, it's so easily for this chakra to, to, to misunderstand that communication. Because you might receive that communication, and then your mind associates it in an egotistical way. So just because this chakra might be working, you still have to meditate or be careful, you know, to, to not just go off what you might think. So, uh, above, the so before, above the solar chakra, the chakra of the solar plexus is Anahata, which is the chakra of the heart. It is related to air, and its vowel is O, which you would pronounce O. And this is the chakra of intuition. This is a, a, a good place to explain that, or to clarify the misconception about Kundalini, which is that if I just simply perform something mechanically, I will be able to raise the, raise the Kundalini. Or there is the idea that you can accidentally raise your Kundalini, that you can accidentally... Uh, go insane, or some terrible thing happened because you're working with this energy. Some of this has to is related to the previous epoch in which you could not speak clearly about this uh, type of teaching, about sexual magic. So the way to, to speak about this was don't, don't, um, don't go searching for this information because you, could f you, you might end up hurting yourself. Because the, the, what they were saying is that you may find someone who would teach you negative, you know, black tantra. So because they couldn't actually teach the white tantra, they said, don't deal with this. You know, one day if you have a guru and the master appears, they'll, they'll teach you. Um, that is, I think, a lot of where the fear came from, where, the, where you're reading that type of literature from the, the previous epoch, and you bring it to this one, and people are, are afraid to work with this energy. So long as you're working in chastity, with prayer, working with your Divine Mother, and you're working with pure intent, the time is that th this current epoch is to work with this energy. It's not going to be dangerous. It's going to be helpful. 
And the other side of it is it doesn't mechanically or automatically or accidentally rise out of the muladhara chakra. There's a fear that it accidentally rises and it will make you sick, it will kill you, it will make you insane. That's not the function of the kundalini. There may be things like that happening, but it's not the function of the kundalini. If someone is dealing with using drugs, dealing, uh, practicing some type of black tantra, maybe those things are happening. There may be uh, difficult ordeals, but it's not the kundalini causing the, this type of sickness or something. The kundalini is what heals. The kundalini might be related to having uh, karmic ordeals, which may have a relationship to getting sick and having to deal with that sickness, but that's your karma. That's your healing process. So, you know, for example, there has been um, you know, stories like someone fell down the stairs or they had, or they got, sh you know, struck by lightning or something. Um, there you might have a spiritual experience or something if you got, got knocked out and the karma was right and you have a spiritual experience, but that wasn't your kundalini awakening. There might be, obviously, a relationship with your divine mother. You might have been hit by lightning and had an out-of-body experience, and you might have experienced different levels. That might be totally authentic, but it, that is not going to awaken your kundalini. The kundalini only gets awoken through ordeals and through merits of the heart. Because it's your divine mother. Your divine mother is conscious. Your divine mother is organizing this. So, as it says here, in order to get the benefit of only one vertebra of the spinal column, the yogi must submit himself to numerous trials and terrible purifications. Every one of our bodies, whether it's a physical body, a vital body, astral, mental, causal, Bodic or atmic has a spinal column with 33 vertebrae. So there are seven serpents, not just a single one. And each one of those is raised in successive order, one after the other. And each one of those vertebrae is related to merits of the heart and karmic ordeals. And a mistake, particularly a mistake related with sex, can drop those vertebrae. You can lose those vertebrae. Uh, in the ascent of that fire. And in order to regain those vertebrae, you have to pay a lot more than you originally did because you have to uh, become aware of the, the error, the crime that you committed in that sense. So this is all organized. You know, the, 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 the fire of the kundalini is organized by the fire of the heart. And when you're talking about the astral, mental, and causal bodies, the kundalini raises to the, to the brow and then descends into the heart. It's fundamental that we learn really what it means to love. Because we cannot advance in these practices simply through a mechanical means. So it's imperative that every student and every aspirant develop that relationship with their Divine Mother. Because she is the one that is going to teach you what love actually is. What we have when we're born on this earth is very pale imitations of what love truly is. We may see that from time to time in our parents, or as a parent, you may time to time embody some of that with the love you have toward your child. But the love that, that your divine mother has is that divine, perfect, infallible love. And that is where you learn. So you have to meditate on this chakra, and you have to meditate on your divine mother. Because she is the one that never leaves you. Even if all the people of this earth leave you, she's the one that's always there. And if you do not have that relationship, how could you possibly advance if you forget your mother? She's always there. She's the one doing all of the really dirty work. You know, she wears a certain type of apron 
when she's killing our egos. We may comprehend those egos and reduce those egos, but she's the one that does the bloody work. She works with that energy. She extracts out of our ego the essence, our own consciousness, and gets rid of the rest, the refuse, the cosmic dust. And it's a bloody work. But that bloody work is that energy. And she does it with a lot of love. So I suggest that if you are not certain what that relationship is between yourself and your Divine Mother, I suggest on meditating on that. So I, I, that's something that you absolutely need. It's, it's spoken of many times um, by the Master Samuel Allen Vior about your relationship with your Divine Mother. And it's something abstract. It's not easy to comprehend. But it's something that if you work at, if you practice with this chakra, with the vowel O, or related mantras, or you um, supplicate your Divine Mother and try to perform dream yoga related with your Divine Mother, you will, you will start to develop that relationship. She's the one that will even follow you into hell. She will never leave you. And if you, and if you choose, or if you are unable to... Um, Defeat your karma, or you choose what's the, the lunar path of, of descent into those inferior kingdoms, she'll follow you there too. And she'll be that fire of the Kunda buffer that eventually burns away your soul so that all that's left is your essence. And she'll do that out of love as well. Because either way, she's working for you. Either way, she's looking to help you. And if, the path, if it's the lunar path, your mother will help you in that sense as well. She'll never leave you. So it's good and even necessary to develop that relationship. Above the um, Anahata chakra is the Vishuddha, which is related to the larynx. And it's the vowel, it's uh, E, or it's, it's the letter I, but we say E. Yeah. No, E, excuse me, E, E, sorry. Yeah. Okay, so the Vishuddha is related to clairaudience. Whosoever learns to meditate on this chakra can know the highest esoteric knowledge of all the sacred books. It's the larynx, which we say, is the uterus of the word, or the, the sexual organ of the cosmo creators is related to that larynx. We can understand this because when we breathe out, that air has no form, but through the larynx, that air vibrates in certain ways, which creates the word, creates our words. So our words might exist mentally in an abstract form, and through the larynx and through the air, through the breath of life, we geometrize or we put vibrations into the word, which transmits information into our ears for someone else to hear. So this is how we can understand how the word creates out of the unmanifested absolute through the verb, and that crystallizes creation. That analogy is we have thoughts in our head which are abstract, which combine with the breath of life, which is coming out of the larynx, right? And we use the larynx to create that. <clears throat> if you were to look at any um, magnetic tape that's recording uh, sound, you'll see that the certain types of shapes are occurring on that tape. It's uh, becoming geometric. And you can see, for example, the shape of those molecules that are, going, that are swirling around in our brain or in our body. The function of those molecules is determined by its geometric shape. So the reason why dopamine works on a certain type of receptor is because of the shape of the receptor. And when those uh, receptor sites don't form the right shape, Sometimes we, we form diseases which are very difficult to uh, heal. Uh, for example, Parkinson's disease is due to the misshapen uh, receptor sites of dopamine. And it's very difficult to figure out why those receptor sites are not folding into the right shape. Obviously, there's a, a, a genetic karma related to that. There's a predisposition and there's something going on there with genetic karma. But that that shape is not being, not being crystallized correctly. And that's being seen as karma in the physical body. So clairaudience 
is related to the understanding of the verb. So the one who is working in this chakra positively is able to read in between the lines or to understand that symbolism of the written scriptures. So you can see if you're reading the scriptures, you know, how do you pull out that symbolic content? You know, it's just when it's written there, how do you know what those symbols are? Well, it's related to this chakra, but it's going to also, of course, be related to intuition as well. So these, these, all these top chakras have to work together. Obviously, all seven have to work together, but you can see how if you were to try to understand a, a scripture, you'd be working with Vishuddha, but you'd also need to work with your heart as well. Now, above Vishuddha is Anya, which is related with the pituitary gland. It's the Church of Philadelphia. Um, it's the letter I, which is pronounced E. And this is where clairvoyance is located, the eye of wisdom. The plexus of this chakra is a lotus flower that sprouts from the pituitary gland. This gland is the page or light bearer of the pineal gland, where the crown of the saints, the lotus of 1,000 petals, the eye of Dangma, the eye of intuition is situated. Psychic clairvoyance by itself, without the development of the coronary chakra, could lead the yogi or yogini astray into grave errors. So, Anya and the following chakra, which is Sahasrara, should be used in combination. And what's being warned here is that, again, just because someone's having clairvoyance, just because someone might see something, you have to understand what the meaning of that sight is. You could <clears throat> see some, something in the inner worlds, but then relate it wrong, in a wrong sense. You might see a symbol of somebody doing a bad behavior. And you might say, well, that person's a, such and such person is a black magician, or some such and such person is doing something evil. But in reality, that, that person may be symbolizing an aspect of yourself. Or it might be related to somebody that something that that person did a long time ago in previous lifetimes. So this is how, um, unfortunately, a lot of problems can be made. Someone who's working with this energy in a positive way, they might start seeing things. They might start experiencing things, you know, information related to the inner worlds because this chakra is activated. But if they don't receive those initiations related with the churches, or if they're not working, you know, if they are just uh, <clears throat> being too superficial and talking a lot, they may cause a lot of problems because they'll, they'll have some type of experience, and then they go tell people about it. And then those people talk, and then other things, you know, it could be a very negative thing. And it's not because the Anya Chakra was giving the wrong information, it's because we combine that with our ego, and we, we interpreted it wrong. So, Sahasrara is related to polyvoyance. And polyvoyance is the combination of clairvoyance with perfect intuition. To be able to see the, to intuitively see. So, intuition allows us to know the internal reality of all the image that float in the astral light. The intuitive clairvoyant is omniscient. A clairvoyant without intuition is like a ship without a compass or a ship without a steering wheel. The intuitive clairvoyant is powerful. So we can see how uh, all of these different chakras need to work in combination. And when you do these practices, when you, you begin to practice, it's inevitable, if you're sincere, that you're going to start having some type of experience. But you have to be careful about that experience. You, you don't want to just make a decision off a simple experience. You might need to meditate. If the, if the experience is uh, true, then number one, some kind of repetition or to repeat it should be, should it be able to happen. And, number, and the second thing would be that it also has some true relationship with the world. It has to make sense. It has to, kind of have an, it has to be agree, agreeable with the concrete facts of the world as well. Um, sometimes that might always not always be obvious, but the bottom line is if you don't need to speak or to say anything or you don't need to make a decision, to, then don't. Continue to meditate. Um, again, a lot of people 
might be able to see things, but they're seeing it only through their ego. Um, certain people, if they have a, um, what's called a psychotic break, or they may just have always had some type of development where they're able to see images very easily. You know, this is just the power of the imagination. It's a natural power that we all have. You know, all these chakras that we said before is just senses of the animal soul. And you may be able to develop that sense kind of in an animalistic way and be able to see things, but it doesn't mean that they're truly objective. You know, if you acquire the initiations and you fully develop the kundalini, then you're developing that intuition. But just because someone's able to see something, someone might... Someone really might be able to have that clairvoyance, but it's a very it's an egotistical, animalistic type of relationship there. Everything could be muddled. It may be, you know, in the same way that you see things in your dreams. What are your dreams about? Sometimes they're very chaotic. There's, all, there's a symbolism buried in there, but they're, they're very chaotic. Now, someone might be able to see something, but they're really seeing it through that ego in a very unconscious way, and they don't know how to make sense of it in the right way. <clears throat> and again, like some of these uh, psychedelic drugs have a relationship with some of the powers and some of the type of experiences you can have on those drugs. We don't recommend using any of them because we know the practices and the way to awaken these chakras in the positive sense. When someone takes uh, some type of psychedelic drug, you may be awakening some of these chakras temporarily in a certain sense. Again, it's a certain molecule that's affecting neurotransmitters that's going to have some type of relationship here. But in today's world, in today's culture, we don't recommend it. We acknowledge that there are cultures from previous epochs, again, that may have even used some substances in a very uh, religious and more or less positive way. But in today's culture, in today's world, for our society, it's not advisable whatsoever in our tradition to do that. <clears throat> so this is the top chakra, the Sahasrara. Um, as you can see, the, this graphic here uh, have all these petals. Sometimes it's you know, called the thousand petaled lotus. If you look at that, it looks, if you were to look at a pine cone from the top, it looks like a pine cone, right? Because it has that same geometric property. And that is why we see a lot of symbolism related with the pine cone. And we see the different staffs, like the staff of Dionysus here. There's a pine cone on the top. Caduceus with the two serpents. Obviously, the serpents represent uh, Ida and Pingala related to a pine cone. And here, the left picture, again, it's a pine cone, but it's, that's in the Vatican. So even... Um, Catholic Church has uh, symbolism related to the pine cone. And obviously, the pine cone comes from those types of trees which are always green. They always have life, uh, even in the winter, even when the sun is uh, its darkest. And that pine cone is that, that source of life which we always have, related to our pineal gland and related to our, our inner star which we call our Ain Sof. So that's where that fundamental light is, is always there. It gives us that eternal life. And uh, physically, we see the spinal medulla, and at the top of the spinal medulla into the brain is the pineal gland. The reason why it's called the pineal gland is that it's shaped, its physical shape looks like a pine cone. <coughs> and we know, of course, that the pineal gland and the sexual glands are related. They're related through those nadis that we talked about, Ida, Pingala, and Shishumna. But the pine cone uh, in this world is related with those trees. Those trees actually have a relationship with water, relationship with the seas, with the, the water element. So we can see that's, that's that esoteric reason why those trees are always staying green. It's because they always are working with the waters. And we need, fundamentally, to activate our chakras, we need to um, seminize our brain and cerebratize our semen. We need to make that, that mixture. 
And through sexual transmutation, you're raising that fire vertebra vertebrae by vertebrae until you make that connection. <clears throat> so, as I said before, there are seven uh, serpents. Serpent related to the physical body, the vital body, the astral body, the mental body, causal body, the buddhic body, and the atmic body. When we talk about the chakras, we're fundamentally talking about all seven of those bodies. But in particular, if we had to pick uh, one, it would be the, either the vital or the astral bodies. The reason being that the chakras make their first connection with the churches with the third degree of fire. So when you're raising the kundalini related to the astral body, that is when those chakras are being connected to the churches. Now, I don't have a picture here, but Hod is the astral body, and above that is Gebera. So that connection from the, the, the chakras of the astral body are becoming connected to the churches in the spiritual soul. <clears throat> so, although we have chakras in all the bodies, we many times point in particular to the astral body, and that's the reason why. This uh, final graphic here just has some relationships or some, some imagery here that we can see the pineal gland. Looks like a small pine cone. And a pituitary gland here. And Blavatsky states that the pituitary gland is the page and light bearer of the pineal gland. And <clears throat> the thalamus, which is here, fortunately not labeled, um, is above the hypothalamus. It's this almost like an egg shape right here in the center. The thalamus is the esoteric heart. So we have our heart, but our esoteric heart is the center of our brain. The center of our body is where our heart is, but the center of the brain is that quote-unquote esoteric heart. So when the serpents um, reach the Sahasrara chakra, if it's the physical or vital body, they, they remain there. But for the astral, mental, and causal bodies, after, after reaching the Sahasrara chakra, they go through the esoteric heart through a special nadi called the Amrita nadi, which then goes down and they rests in the heart because that's, again, that, that uh, relationship with the Divine Mother. So there are many, many different nadis that we could talk about in relationship to all this, but that's just one of those, one of those uh, few. Uh, that, that Amrita nadi goes from the heart through the esoteric heart and through, you know, at the top through the Sahasrara chakra. So that's where that, the, um, that heart wisdom, that connection between your heart and your, and your head and the, the energy above is through that Amrita Nadi. So in summary, um, we have seven chakras as our animal, uh, as our animal uh, senses, but it's through developing them, through raising the kundalini energy, which is the energy of the akash, through the seven uh, bodies, that those chakras become the seven churches. And when we send the word to the seven churches, we then are preparing ourselves to um, unleash the seven seals, which is those seven serpents of light. So first we have the seven serpents of fire, which create, the, which activate the churches. And then once we have the seven serpents of fire, then we can un unseal the seven seals, which are related to the seven serpents of light. Do you have any questions? Right. good question. Um, you have seven chakras and seven vowels. When we do a certain practice, 
We say e a o u a m s, and we we relate we relate those seven vowels with the seven parts of of the body. The difference is that the first two chakras are related to only one syllable, e, which is related to sahasrara and the chakra anya. So e a a is the throat, e a o is heart, u is the solar plexus, and then a. And you can, you, you can hear that, ah, uh, that's in the lungs. When you make the letter ah, uh, that sound, ah, uh, those are the chakra of the lungs, which are really, you know, back here. So, again, there's different ways to relate those seven. But we have many, many more chakras. And the chakra of the lungs is another fundamental chakra. It just isn't one of the seven in the spinal column. It's right next to it. They're definitely very important. Um, but... That's why there are, when we do that seven vowel practice, we have the lungs. But in this lecture, I didn't really mention it. You mentioned um, that the chakras uh, are related to and, and actually impact and transmit their energy into the hormones and right. the organs. Um, we know from various uh, medical science into the brain or you can put uh, you know, electroshock into the brain and you can change the psyche of a, of a, of a patient. Um, so, you know, we're, we're taught ways of transforming our own psyche using, using meditation practices, using, you know, so not using invasive things like right. that. Right. Uh, procedures and whatever, does that go the other way and affect, does that energy flow the other way, does that affect the, the organization and the, and the movement of our chakras? So, yeah, so I, I think the question, there's a lot of different cases within that, within that question. Um, fundamentally, the question is, we can operate in a way that we're bringing in all this energy, you know, from the from the prana and the akash and the ether into our into our body, into our chemical uh, functions. But we can also, you know, uh, stick an electrode in the brain and have a have a result appear. Or we can take uh, certain types of drugs, or we can eat um, altered foods, and these all might have a relationship. They all do have a relationship, definitely. Um, Definitely putting substances into your body is going to create a certain type of relationship. Even uh, nicotine and caffeine is going to have some type of relationship with your physical and vital body. Because, I mean, it's obviously affecting your, your vital body there. Um, and the more serious drugs definitely can cause a certain elasticity of, the, of that expression to be kind of uh, injured. You know, someone can kind of, you know, injure themselves. I wouldn't, in their, in their vital sense, so that it's harder for those chakras to pull the energy in and, and right and correctly. So there's going to be a, re a relationship there. In, in the sense of uh, eating altered foods, well, the altered foods don't have the prana in them because we've altered the genetic components. And that's why, you know, you might be eating something, but you're, you're, you're nourishing your physical body, but not really... Uh, you're not really putting the right energy in there in an energetic aspect. Now, in the sense of like putting a, an electrode in your brain and you could get a result. Well, obviously, you know, uh, we're going to get a result there because the human, the, our body is a machine, right? And, and there's a ways to impact that. How far up, you know, is it going to negatively affect the astral body? Probably not, but your relation, their fi for the, the ability for your physical body to like connect and, and have that relationship occur will be affected. Um, so, you know, if you have a physical injury, 
you're going to have even a relationship change with your, with your chakras as well. And the physical body can be altered in a whole different, all different types of ways, and it can you know, cause a negative result, I think is kind of the synthesis of that answer. Any other questions? Uh, you talked a lot about like the messenger, like the neurotransmitter and stuff. And so the, the Greeks called Mercury the messenger, right? So what, what was the, the relationship between Mercury and, the, and the, all the, the messengers within the body? Does Mercury kind of rule over those? Well, that's a, yeah, that's an interesting question. And Mercury is definitely the messenger of the gods, right? And uh, one thing I forgot to mention, it was on a slide, but I forgot to talk about it, was the... Uh, Chemical messengers, you know, in, in Greek, messenger is angel. So in a certain way, you can, have, you can think of those chemical messengers as a certain type of molecular angels when, when they're combined with the tattva um, goes into the chakra, and the chakra puts the energy into the molecule. Now, Mercury himself being the messenger of the gods is the one, you know, closest to the sun, and uh, that Mercury is also related with uh, our sexual energy. So it's, it's, you know, our sexual energy in one form or another is in every cell of our body. Every cell that we have is the ability to, to split and reproduce. So mercury is everywhere, and mercury is that fundamental substance that we need to, to work with. Um, and it's that energy that, that connects us to God. It's through that energy that we have that connection. Okay, thank you. To learn more about what you learned in this lecture, we invite you to explore the books published by Gloria and Publishing, available from booksellers worldwide. You may also be interested in online courses or upcoming retreats, all of which you can learn about at GnosticTeachings.org. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Will you help others to benefit from this knowledge? Most spiritual schools recommend a donation of $10 to $20 per lecture. Every donation helps. Make a donation now at GnosticTeachings.org. Thank you. May all beings be happy.